and I'll go ahead and start kind of messing around with this stuff. So um, let me go home and start a uh, TMUX shell. Uh, all right, so what, what I'm spending more time on today is, is annotating these transcripts. So we at least already got through um, pulling out open reading frames, comparing them to a BLAST database to get some amount of identity to it. So let's see that test and how it's doing. All right, so, so I, I modified, I, it, it, it gets a little messy, so I, so I modified my liver um, directory a little bit, so I have all my reads and stuff in a symbol, and then my transcripts are um, the Trinity output, and so, so what I'll be messing with, with from Trinity output. So um, from the Trinity, raw Trinity output, I ran it through Trans Decoder to get all of my transcripts, and from here, I kind of want to start counting. I, I kind of want, I just want to have a good idea of what has actually been annotated uh, in my, from my Trinity output. So from that, I might just start counting sequences. Um, so we'll reference for the open carrot on my Trinity. So again, this shows, just tells me I, have a, I, I ultimately had 132,000 simple transcripts. Um, And so I ran trans decoder on that. And I have my longest or stuff. Um, and I think from here, I think I have, um, yeah, 74,000 trans. So of those 132,000 transcripts, um, 74,000 of them actually had an open reading frame on it. So there at least there is this string of amino acids that are linked together. And then, so, and then I ran my BLAST, so I compared, did my BLAST P output, um, ran my BLAST P command on the query. The query is the, um, not that, the longest ORF, the PEP file. Um, the DB is uh, in data, uh, Swiss plot, um, that, and then all of my other parameters, out format six and, and um, number of threads, et cetera. So, Whenever, whenever you're doing this yourself, you probably at least want to assign 10 threads to this because this does take a long time. I did it last night to make sure it would work to, to build this file and let it run as far as it could, or as long as it had to. Um, I think it was doing a thousand annotations per 10 minutes. And you know we're talking about 74,000 reads. So, or sorry, 74,000 transcripts. So this one does take a long time. I don't know how long it took. Um, but I let it run overnight, and I would kind of recommend y'all do too. Definitely run this in a Tmux, um, so it will actually finish without worrying about disconnecting. Anyways, um, from all of that stuff, I, instead of running the whole command again, I, I just made this file, and my file is this trans um, trans blast tab. So it's just my the blast output file of my transcripts, and so from my transcripts. Um, again, if we're lo if I'm looking at this and I'm and I am uh, so I have my first column. So, uh, this is a generic tab delimited blast output file. So there there are like seven or eight ways you can get blast output file, and that's all controlled through the out format option. Out format six just says give this give this to me in a tab delimited form. And so my tabs, my column information are my the transcript name or the ORF name, the annotation, the hit name from the Swissprot database, a percent identity, uh, length of the alignment, um, how many gaps were present. I think this is uh, oh man, this is either gaps or mismatches. This may be mismatches. Um, how many mismatches were present? Uh, how many gaps were present in that alignment, um, the starting position of the query sequence, so this would be my transcript, the end position of my query, my transcript, um, the starting position where that hit actually started. So this is the region of the hit on this, on this um, in the database. Um, so that's the start, 
that's the stop of the hit, um, an E value, and a bit score. So this E value, again, is kind of like a probability. It's like, what's the probability that this sequence and this sequence were identical by chance? And that's like 3.8 times 10 to the negative 8. Uh, 80th, real or 90th, really, 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 really low. Um, however, this only spans about 138 amino acids, and most proteins hover around three, 300 amino acids, plus or minus. Um, and you can see, like, so, so yeah, this was probably my entire open reading frame, um, 138 amino acids, but it only matched to the last portion of this of the hit. So from, from amino acids 451 to 588. And it tells us that this is kind of a partial hit. And I bet if I look in my uh, um, my trans decoder output, if I look for that sequence in my trans decoder output, um, I bet it's going to tell me it's a three prime UTR. Now it's going to say it's internal. So so even be, there's more protein there are more amino acids beyond this than what we're actually annotated, right? So we don't, we didn't see a file, we didn't see a start codon or a stop codon. Um, so honestly, I have no idea how long that hit actually is. Anyways, so so it's more or less today. I'm spending time on Linux tricks to help us read this file. So one is, is the WC. This is a work count. Um, and dash L is a, is a line count. So I just want to see how many lines are in this file. Um, I'm going to count them. And so I have 42,000 lines in here. And so that would suggest, if I'm being as, as taking as many assumptions as I can out of the 75,000 open reading frames that we discovered, only 45,000 of ASHA of them had some similarity to a known protein coding gene, right? Um, however, there is some weirdness. So if I look at um, another, another command that's going to help us, we've already seen before, it's the cut command. So we're going to be using cut um, a lot uh, for this little module. I'm going to have you all practice with cut a little bit on, on your um, on your blast output file. So remember cut um, will pull columns out of a tab delimited file based off of the F uh, option. The dash F tells us which column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, which column or columns we actually want to pull out. So I may want to pull out um, column one in my trans output class. And so that's going to print <laughs> Call and turn your mic off, man. Um, uh, uh, this is going to tell us the, uh, it's giving us our, our first column. And so I am going to introduce a new command that we haven't seen before is, is sort. Um, so what sort does is that we may see, actually see the same sequence on multiple occasions. So we may see the same transcript name on multiple occasions. Here's a good example. These three um, queries are the same sequence. Um, so ultimately what that means is we probably got three annotations for the same sequence. And then again, this is just a weird blast output thing or blast thing. So blast is great. It works, in, works fantastic 95% of the time, but that 5% even, um, can cause some headaches. So even like we have 74,000 reads, 45,000 hits possibly, um, even at a 5% error rate, we're still talking about 10,000, not 10,000, maybe like 8,000 uh, or uh, um, I can't math very well. I think it'd be about 2,500 transcripts will be misannotated. And that, that's just a common thing with BLAST. You'll always see this 5% this error rate um, inherent. It's just because we can't make everything 100% perfect. So what I'm kind of getting is, is that we have more transcript hits in our file than what are at, what's actually present given the line count. So if I do the line count, I might see 45,000 annotations, but 
um, I may not actually see that. So I'm going to cut out that first column in, and then I'm going to sort. So what this will do is that if we see the same same query sequence multiple times, it's just going. We should see that easier. Um, sort's really not a great use here because at least for the query sequences, it's already sorted. Um, but anyways, what a new command that we can use is unique. And so what unique does is that it's going if there are multiple line uh, multiple lines with the same information, it's going to get rid of all of the additional duplicates. Right. So if I uh, if I cut, cut the first column and do a unique, right now it's going to get rid of all those duplicates that would otherwise be present. And so if I do my line count again, so I've done, I've cut this out, now I've picked out just the unique lines and do a line count. There are actually 37,000 unique um, query sequences in this BLAST output file. So even though there are 45,000 lines, there are actually only 35,000 uh, sequences that actually have an annotation. So it, again, it's about half of the tran trans decoder output that actually gets annotated. All right, and so a nice thing about unique is that we also have a couple of options associated with it. Let me see if I can see what the help me looks like. Okay, so there are two really helpful um, options with unique. Is one is the dash C option, and this is going to count how many times we see the same occurrence. And the D option is going to is is if it's going to ignore all the all the lines that were counted once and only report lines that were counted two or more. So let's kind of look at an example using dash C and dash D on this output. So bring up that line, dash C, it's going to, again, th what this is going to do is how many instances each transcript was present in this file. So, so most of them are one, so they're only present once. But this transcript was present in our file nine times. And if we want to use to get rid of all of the unique hits um, and just look at transcripts that, are, that were present more than one time, use that dash D option, then we can get an idea of how many times um, for these transcripts, when we see two or more annotations, how many transcripts are actually, how, how many annotations were, annotations were actually present. And we can take this another step forward and type this into our WC-L. It's going to, this will tell us how many, um, how many transcripts were actually counted two or more times. So there are 24,000 transcripts that are actually counted two or more times, right? So um, using cut unique WC-L, we can, we can learn a lot about our files. All right, so we have, um, so we know that 35,000 transcripts were actually annotated. But let's actually look at our output. And we're specifically, specifically going to look at this second column. And so we actually see three transcripts that were all annotated with the same gene. So this is the same annotation for three different transcripts. So our, our, our annotations are definitely redundant in this output file. And so we can use the same tricks using cut, sort, unique, et cetera, to figure out how many unique annotations, how many different protein coding genes do we actually see? Because we're already seeing redundancy in our transcript. So we're seeing this kind of redundancy um, where we have three different transcripts. Remember, these, these are three, three assembled transcripts um, that have the same annotation. So let's see. So instead of cutting on the first column, I'm going to cut on the second column. And so that's just going to give me all of the hits that were actually outputted. Okay, now these are not sorted, right? The first column is already sorted, but the second column is not sorted. Um, so I would then pipe it to sort um, to give me all of the unique, uh, to give me 
redundant transcripts right next to each other. So, so here we have, uh, that's not a redundant transcript. Oh, I'm not cutting on one. I want to cut on two. I want to cut on. There we go. So now we have um, our redundant hits. So, so several transcripts had this exact same hit, several here, et cetera. Um, and we'll take this another step further and use our unique uh, command to just pull out the unique sequences that were the unique hits. Um, and then I may want to count them, just going to count all those lines up. So we actually see 12,000 different annotations. And this is pretty common of a tissue uh, of RNA in general. We use, even though there are 20,000 protein coding genes in a genome, about every tissue only expresses somewhere between eight to 12,000 unique transcripts or unique genes. Um, so let's, let's take this another step further uh, with our unique, playing with unique, uh, we'll, we'll count them. So unique dash C. Um, some, of, some of these hits are present once. Uh, here, here's a, a hit that was present once, but here's a hit that was present um, 16 different times. And so I want, I, so I try to ask questions that actually make you look at these files because I mean, you don't learn anything if you just have the file made, but you're not actually browsing through and using our tools to kind of see what's, what's, in, these, what's in these files. So this, this thing is present 16 times, this hit is present 16 times. So I make rep on this hit just to see if, um, uh, uh, let's see if I need to make sure that's in quote, I need to quote that line. Otherwise it is reading the pipes like pipes and it's, it's doing something funky. Um, but let's see, there's unique transcript. There's um, the same transcript a few times, same uh, unique transcript, same transcript a few times, whatever. But most of these, so we see the same Trinity base. So Trinity DN 190. Blah, 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 blah. So how Trinity kind of works is that it's going to give us a general annotation, but it may decide, it may figure out that several of these assembled transcripts are fairly identical to one another, or at least all that's splitting them apart, or all that's differentiating from each other is a handful of bases here and there. It's called a bubble. And so Trin Trinity will, will pop this bubble and the De Bruin graph and produce like um, different variants. And these variants may actually be uh, related to um, transcript variants or isoform variants. So, so there, the, this may actually be true. This, may, this gene may be present this many times. It's just going to be present in this number of variations. So we may see these kinds of spliced isoforms um, vary in our tissue. Not, not all that surprising to see this. This could also be an artifact of you know, we can't do everything perfectly 100% of the time. So we see these artifacts. And it's always hard to tell the difference between a real transcript splice variant or an assembly artifact, right? That, that's always kind of tricky. But we for, sure, we for sure can say that this DN, there's a mouse, this DN 54803, is definitely a different tra a symbol transcript than DN190. So we effectively have two different transcripts that are pointing to the same gene. Again, this is just usually deal due to some weirdness that's going to happen in assemblies. Um, let's see, let's see what else. Uh, so going back to our command that we're actually um, counting, sequences, sorting, and all that stuff. So from here, we actually can take this another step further and sort based on the number. So, so based on the number of transcript hits, um, 10, 2, 7, whatever, um, and, and sort this again. But if I sort it as is, it's going to sort it like it's text. So I need to call this option sort dash into sort it on a number. And so then it's going to to sort these hits based off of how many times they were present in this, in this, in this output file. And so our most common gene annotation was this AN, uh, AN, sorry, AHNK human. 
Uh, we can figure out what gene this is by, by checking in the Swiss prot database or, or somewhere else. We can't figure out what that gene actually does. It very well could be um, unannotated or uncharacterized, um, but that's not so important. Um, common things, these, the, the common annotations, common genes expressed highly are always have the ZN number. So ZN or ZFP um, or FINC. So what, what these are, these are zinc finger proteins. Um, these are really, really common in every single tissue. These, these zinc finger proteins, they could be um, transcription factors. Right, what, what that means is a zinc finger protein is that it binds to DNA. We may not know exactly what it's doing other than it can bind to DNA. So it could be a transcription factor, um, could be a repressor, could be an inhibitor, um, could be an activator, could be um, a, a, a polymerase of some kind, just something that can actually bind to DNA. And these things are everywhere. There are so many different zinc finger proteins. Um, so many different of us, a lot of them, and they're always highly expressed in any tissue you look at. But yeah, so, so, but we should, if we actually list this information, we should see that the solid majority of them are present only once. Now, hopefully that's, that's kind of what we want. Um, but if we have 30, or sorry, 12,000 of these that are unique genes, um, we can do, use our unique dash CD to, to tell us, um, to print, print out just the duplicate, how many things that were present more than one. So I may want to count this and say 8,000 of them. 8,000 of out of the 12,000 um, were present on, one, on two or more different transcripts. Sorry. Being distracted. So let's see. Um, let's look at one of our big ones. So let's 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 sort this again. Let me sort this again. And just to get an example, I'm just going to get one that has 50 hits. Um, MP, DZ, mouse. Don't know what it is. Just know that's for mouse. So I'm going to grip on this. Um, grip on this G name. On our on our trans blast output. So we definitely have multiple transcripts being linked to this DN16868, DN5238, DN67330, right? These are definitely all unique transcripts that all have the same annotation on it. Um, and so there's definitely among all of these different hits, we definitely do see the same transcript being annotated by the same gene in multiple regions. Again, this is just some weirdness caused by blast. Usually the first hit um, is the best one, right? So 92% identity and after that it's just, it's just crap. And most of these are just really short reads that are hitting to um, uh, different regions in the protein. I, I draw this up to, to point out our um, e values and our bit scores. So let's say if we're so the whole point of this is when we're looking at our e values and bit scores to say, okay, we have a thousand different annotations for the same gene. We have a thousand different transcripts, all with the same genetic information on it, which is probably the best representative of that gene among our transcripts. So among all of our transcripts, which one's probably the best representative? And so we can find the best representative based off of an e-value and the bit score. So, so this is a pretty good hit. It's 92% identical for 400 amino acids, um, has an e-value of zero, no surprise, and a pretty high bit score. And if we look at this transcript, um, also a very good transcript, 100% um, identity for 300 amino acids, E value of zero and a bit score of 619. Um, and here's another one, 100% identity, 393, E value of zero, 803. So if I want to pick the best representative of this gene, at least what we can give off of the screen, it's going to be decided by the bit score, right? So if three transcripts are all producing an E value of zero, which is effectively saying, yeah, these two sequences are like 100% or real close to 100% identical, which one's the best? 
um, what's the tiebreaker, this bit score would be used as the tiebreaker. Um, so in this case, if I were trying to pick the best representative of this annotation, then I would pick this transcript to pull out out of the out of our trend, uh, trans decoder information and sit and try to link this information to that information. Say this this sequence came from that gene, right? Okay. So I think I think that's all. I I want to say that's all I had planned to talk about today is is um, Playing with playing with our output to figure out how many how many hits we have, how many transcripts are actually unique, how many annotations are actually unique. We have multiple annotations or or the same annotation for multiple transcripts. Which one is probably the best representative, right? Um, if we have multiple annotations, how many are present? Um, what's the most common? These are just some kind of questions. They they aren't necessarily helpful in a publication, but for me understanding my data, these are the questions I'm going to start asking. Um, what is the best? How many are there? What percentage of my full transcriptome, right, 132,000 transcript seem to be protein coding? And how many of those protein coding genes are actually annotated, are present? We know about them, we know what they do, right? Because it's easier to work with stuff that we know and stuff that we don't know. So even though we may have a, uh, a protein coding gene, we definitely have this sequence, there's a start codon, there's a stop codon, it is doing something. It's probably a, a real protein doing something, but it hasn't either been annotated yet or um, we don't know its function. And if we don't know its function, then it's really hard for us to do anything computationally with it. At that point, we would have to like go into the lab see where it's expressed, what, what proteins it's interacting with, all, all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really hard to work with. Much, much easier for computational biologists to work with what's known, um, at least for protein coding genes and that kind of thing. All right, so I think I'm gonna call it there. Um, I'm not gonna Zoom, uh, I'm not gonna do anything on Friday. Um, I'm just gonna let you all work with um, exercises and ask me questions on a long look. Um, things like that. Um, but if you have any questions about this, now's probably a good time to ask or just send me an email later. So does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. All right. Um, let me know, send me an email. Uh, what, what do you prefer if you prefer uh, the Zoom or, or YouTube? Um, let me know. Uh, and we'll we'll make a decision about what to do uh, for the rest of the semester with this. All right, all right. I'm going to end all this. Are you time. uploading this? Are you uploading this to uh, yeah. YouTube? Yeah, I'll, I'll upload it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. There we go.